I'm just going to go through uh, the precious metal sector right now because uh, that's always what people like to focus in on. And I'm just going to go through uh, this discussion about the investment clock. Okay, so the investment clock was built out by the Lions Select Group, uh, and other people have talked about it before. And so what I'm just going to do here is talk about, you know, the investment clock is different for every commodity, and you could be in a different time zone for each commodity. And uh, the trends, and this is what I wanted to emphasize here, is that the clock that I'll show you has a whole bunch of parts in it that I've added to it. But I'm just going to go over certain parts of it and then talk about what that part says about what time it is on the clock, and they might not all give us the same time. That's why I want to emphasize. So we'll talk about the expiration, talk about the trends in expiration, where do I think we are with respect to what's happening in expiration in terms of the investment cycle, M&A activity, which we've just seen a, a recent one with uh, Yamana and, uh, and Goldfields, the balance sheets. And this is important because uh, this is very different in terms of the health of a lot of companies uh, versus other cycles. We'll talk about financing, which obviously for the non-cash flowing retail sector is very important. And where are we there? Uh, and for producers, it's what's getting hit right now. And what we're seeing is inflation hitting their operating and capital costs. And then lastly, reserve prices, which is actually, again, very interesting because the majors are using much lower gold prices than we're seeing right now. And is that going to change? And what are development and exploration companies actually using for reserve prices or resource prices right now? Okay, so this is very complicated, and we're not going to do all of this. But you, as you can see, there's a lot of things to talk about here in terms of what happens between the cycle starting around 1 p.m., 1 a.m., prices stabilizing around 3.30, a boom at about 6, and then as, as, uh, as we go into sell, we see higher M&A risks, higher, copper, uh, higher costs, and then we move into prices stabilize and stop rising. And then we start seeing the opposite before we get a crash, and then we go back again. So right now, we're going to look at specific parts of that sect uh, of this graphic. So we'll start with expiration. So the, the things that we're going to watch, expiration budgets, discoveries, and uh, any changes. So this graphic is basically about uh, ex gold expiration budgets in US dollars in the millions from uh, 1997 uh, to uh, last year, 2021. So as you can see, and this has happened for almost every commodity, exploration peaked in uh, 2012. And uh, it had a good run in 2021 in terms of expiration budgets, and I'll show you later the reason for that, especially in the gold sector, is that juniors control a lot of the expiration budget, and they, could, they were tapping a lot more money from the equity sector at that time. The other thing I want to point out in this, which is interesting, is expiration is segmented between grassroots advanced exploration and brownfields. And what the majors were doing was a lot of brownfields. And so what we've been seeing is the proportion of grassroots versus every other type of exploration declining. So that's an issue. And that's a secular issue that's not driven by anything that we're seeing in the cyclicality of the investor sector. That's something that the majors are just not doing anymore in the gold sector. That's not the case in copper. That's not the case in nickel and other metals, but it's definitely the case in gold. So if juniors are hit by not being able to finance, then this might be problematic uh, uh, going forward. So if we take an example of a major company and what they've been doing, so this is Barrick. Barrick cyclically over the last two decades and I've looked at their exploration and uh, budgets that they spend on studying projects as well uh, as they um, do on their income statement, and then actually looked at that amount of money versus the revenue they generated. So when gold price was much lower and they generated less revenue, so that would be the denominator, 
8% of that revenue was redirected into exploration. And it's gone up and down, down to about 2%. Since the creation of Nevada Gold Mines and the merger of equals with Rand Gold, now we're seeing it more like a 2% number. But you can see that, more importantly, there's been a decline in the actual expenditure. So we could see 2%. But if we have stable exploration budgets, that's fine. But what we're seeing is a bit of a decline here. And that might be symptomatic of the entire sector. So in terms of discoveries, like so I was at the GSN symposium in Reno, Nevada. And before that, they had a big site visit to a lot of uh, deposits in the Walker Lane. One company that was very reticent in showing their stuff was Anglo Gold Ashanti. Uh, the South African-based company had done a deal with Ren Gold, a junior uh, prospect generator in Nevada, five years before. Ren Gold spent about, you know, I don't know, four months on this prospect, did some rock chips, never got much, 34 parts per billion gold at surface. Uh, they optioned it to uh, to Angle Gold, which is typically what these uh, what the company's uh, modus operandi is. So, f five years later, uh, Angle Gold makes a major discovery and declare a resource of about 3.4 million ounces of about a gram that's open pitable, and uh, from their studies, heat bleachable. And they're thinking that they're on their way to five easy, and potentially ten in that district. And they also were the ones that bought Corvus to tie up the ground around them and also to tie up the water rights. And what's interesting is the technical report that they actually issued for a maiden resource, which was 100% inferred, had metallurgy, had uh, blocks for how that open pit was going to look like, and economics, which is almost like that just doesn't happen for an inferred resource that's actually issued by a major. So they're super keen on developing this project very quickly. Um, so this is grassroots exploration still works because they made the discovery because, as I said, the junior just got 34 parts per billion gold at surface and the problem was that there was a chalcedonic blanket on top that didn't have anything. And what they ended up drilling was this, and that's really where it is. And so that's really opened up the Walker Lane again to look for and not discard projects that have these chalcedonic blankets on top. Okay, so uh, where are we right now? I suspect we're on the latter part of that buy envelope uh, with respect to expiration. So M&A is an important part of looking at the clock. What are people interested in? Where are they taking projects out? What are they paying for them? Who's getting taken out? So the problem with M&A or anything like that is that uh, when we get overzealous, and majors and acquirers tended to do, like back in, when I worked for Newmont in the, uh, in the was it 2000s, uh, they, uh, you know, people were trading for two and a half price to net asset value and you were paying premiums of, the average premium would be 35% probably. But you, some papers were getting paid, uh, taken out for much more. And you would build projects, and then when the gold price goes down, the book value that you held that project at versus the market value of that project because now the gold price had gone down, that's when you take a write down. And so for Barrick, and I'm just using Barrick because they actually make it easy to get all their data. I'm not picking on them. But if you look, it took them like from 2012 to uh, 2016, almost four years to write off some of their major faux pas, including Pascualama, the purchase of La Moana, uh, Sarah Casale, and stuff like that. Pascualama, that took like three or four years to write down because I remember they wrote it down like two or three times. But what we're seeing is probably a little bit more risky m and I mean, depending on what you think about pre Kim's Bruce Jack deposit in the Valley of Kings, which I have visited, uh, you know, problematic resource for sure. Uh, but as they started showing that they could generate free cash flow uh, consistently and, and could generate this kind of production profile, 
a major, Newcrest Mining, which already made a $700 million investment to take about 70% of Red Chris, was already in the neighborhood, did their own due diligence. And also, the way that they did the resource, the multiple indicator Krieging, is very much an Australian concept. So they might have been more comfortable with it. And so that asset was taken out. But again, that asset has been around for a while. And a lot of people might have thought that it got taken out here when they started actually producing 350,000 ounces or more per year. But a lot of majors didn't want to touch it because they were worried that that 350 would go down to 200. So, um, yeah. So Newcrest apparently is more uh, uh, happy with that situation uh, and, and, and the potential synergies with Red Chris. But nonetheless, risky given the resource. Okay, another one is Great Bear. Perfect, you know, in terms of being a retail person, owning Great Bear and getting 15 times return. But Kinross, who post this acquisition had to write off Russia, uh, really needed a lot of geopolitical diversification because they were getting discounted for cash flows and their price to net asset value because of their geopolitical risk. And that's probably the reason they also listed in London. But soon after all that, Russia happened, and they had to basically uh, take a write down. But uh, the important thing here is, though, you know, uh, Great Bear drilled a lot. They did a great job on this deposit, but there was no resource on this deposit. But they spent as if there was at least eight and a half million ounces here. But they still have to do at least 200,000 more meters of drilling to find that out. Okay, another one was, a, was this strange merger that just happened where Goldfields acquires Yamana. And I was talking to some people on a recent site visit, and they were all surprised that it happened in, in Toronto. And, and when I worked for Newmont, um, we were looking at this for the longest time because it was weird that we were looking at Meridian that had El Peñon, and they traded at about a 2.5 PNAV. But once they got bought by Yamana, all the assets started trading at 1.5 PNAV because it was Yamana that bought it. So they've been around for a while and uh, they were always a target, but a target like Halloween that would come every year that you would look at and discard. Uh, but Goldfields actually came out and bought it, you know, uh, and they offered a 41% premium all share transaction. When I think a lot of Yamada shareholders would have just been fine with a coffee mug with Maroney's face on it. But they took that Investors weren't happy about it. They lost about, I think it was a two and a half, two point six billion dollars of market cap when they announced that. Uh, now the premium's gone from forty one percent to ten. So, importantly here is that most of the near term is given by goldfields, like sixty to seventy percent of the value is given by goldfields. But the long term is what they're thinking. Goldfields is given by Yamana. And the biggest part of that, that long term is Agua Rica, a project I visited. I lived in Argentina for eight years. That, that was BHPs back in the 90s. A great deposit, but now they're thinking that they won't process it there, that they'll ship it to Bajo del Umbrera that, uh, that uh, needs feed. Different type of mineralogy, but that's like 50 million ounces plus of gold equivalent ounces. That's really, I think, the embedded prize here but that's not gonna be easy to permit. So importantly, like the 66 and two thirds majority, you know, Yamana, and that's not gonna be a problem. The problem will be the 75% that Goldfields needs. But talking to people because of how many people sold that day and how many people bought, that might actually be possible now. It wouldn't have been possible before they lost $2.6 billion in market cap. But if they don't do it, if gold feels actually they don't get the vote, the break fee is like 450 million US. So for Yamana, that works out as well because that would take away their net debt position, which they're sitting at about 320 million. So it's a win win for Yamana, even if it doesn't happen. So, in terms of the cycle, it looks more like, in terms of the sector, more like a sell because we're seeing more higher risk MA. We're seeing MA but it's not a slam dunk. So if we look at balance sheets, it's completely the opposite. So if we look at somebody like Barrick, again, not picking on him, just 
they give a lot of data, which is nice. If we look at net debt position, which is just your long-term debt on your balance sheet minus your working capital, which is netting out current assets and uh, current liabilities, you can see that if you've got a big positive number, that's bad. And so this has been bad for a while. That bad took almost a decade to get rid of. And that's a lot of debt that they compiled through uh, Pasqualama building and stuff like that. And now they're into a nice negative debt position. But this leaves them in good standing if they actually do build a project like Rico Dick in, uh, in Pakistan, which requires quite a few billion dollars. And so if we look at another major, uh, precious metals, silver, but mostly they produce gold right now, uh, uh, Pan American. So if we look, even though they're, you can see their net debt position coming way down, and that's negative 600 million. So you can see that's driven by their huge working capital position and the CEO's determination to get rid of his debt. So he's set up to capitalize and fund the La Colorado SCARN project, if that gets built, or if Escobar comes back online. He's set up to basically take on more debt and get that stuff into production. Okay, so in terms of the clock, we're in a good position with respect, to, uh, with respect to balance sheets, which was not the case in the last cycle. Okay, now let's look at equity financing, which is obviously something people want to know about with respect to uh, the junior sector. So this graphic is just funds raised U.S. million, but only in Q1. So I'm comparing all Q1s to, to remove any seasonality. So as we can see, the peak was definitely last year. We raised well more uh, than $2 billion in equity financings. Uh, that's fallen, but it's still pretty good in terms of historical numbers. It still is more than the last peak, which would have been 2018. So the question is, is that sustainable uh, going forward? I mean, most of the juniors I talk to are finding it harder and harder to raise money, but I still see an equity financing every now and then. But um, we're seeing more financing, I would say, in the base metal space and the critical metals than, uh, than the precious metal space right now. And so, you know, if we go back to this number, some of that number was actually generated by this transaction. So this was a weird one where this is a project I visited, I know a lot about, and it's a refractory gold deposit low sulfidation epithermal, you know, they don't want to put a roaster or an autoclave because it would take 20 years to permit. Uh, so they want to do a different technology, which has never worked. Uh, but they keep, you know, ramming their head against the, uh, the wall. And, but they found somebody who knows even less about gold metallurgy to finance them. So, so a theater company, AMC, and, and, um, and, and Mr. X brought, bought in uh, a 22% interest, uh, 28 million bucks, but that was just a seed of interest. And so they asked, well, why are you in this to this guy, uh, Adam Aaron? And he says, well, we can help them with financing. And I thought, well, how the hell are they going to help them with financing? And so they brought in the Reddit crowd who hate hedge funds that short companies. And, and these guys had a big short position. So the whole idea was to squeeze that short position. And how they did it, they put in an at-the-market facility and from that $28 million initial financing, they did another 140 on the at the market. So they took advantage of all of that. And I can tell you, talking to some other fund managers, these guys were desperate to raise money at 30 cents down there. But why raise money at 30 cents when you can raise it at a buck 75? So that had nothing to do with news flow, nothing to do with improved metallurgy, all to do with the Reddit crowd. And if you look at the feedback on the Reddit crowd, Again, they didn't know anything about metallurgy. They just talked about ounces, and they were more targeting the hedge funds. The connection there was Mudrick Capital that owned both AMC and had a significant position in uh, uh, Highcroft. So at the money equity transactions, which we're seeing more of, that sort of says we're taking uh, 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 going later in the, in the cycle. So looking at costs. And that's obviously something a lot of people think about. And if we look at Pan American, which is a company I used to own, but I sold because of this, 
but we were seeing marginals decline. So this is only a couple of years ago where their operating income was relatively high, and they, but they were getting a big margin, like almost 40%. That, because of operational challenges uh, due to their um, shaft that they were building, the ventilation shaft at La Colorado, uh, and also costs, which I'll, which I'll highlight, got them down to less than, to about 10% in the first, uh, in the last quarter of 21. It's slightly improved, but it, uh, that's what we're worried about with producers. So if we look at what's driving this, it's everything. There's nothing specific. It's everything. And if you went back and looked at companies, uh, MDNAs, uh, you know, they were hedging or modeling $60 oil, you know, um, and that, that's one thing, but labor availability, and not because a whole bunch of people are building or anything like that, it's just, there's nobody around. And then also some South American countries, and these guys operate a lot in Mexico and that, still have issues with COVID, and their productivity levels are very low. So even though you might think where you are, COVID's over, it's not over in a lot of other places. And if we look at some other companies, you got First Majestic Silver here. They bought Jarrett Canyon in March 2021. Don't ask me why. But there, this is the gold price. Recognize that's their all-in sustaining cost. When this number is bigger than this number, that's not good. Okay. And Great Panther, consolidated all in sustained cast. Q122 was 75% higher than the year before. And then Novo Resources, uh, Western Australia, uh, it exceeded its realized gold price, again, problematic, by 15%. And so, it, like, is this happening everywhere? Yes. So this is a copper producer that I own, and I visited the project. Um, and you can see their operating costs have gone up 14%. The difference is that the copper price has gone up because the copper price is a better leading indicator of inflation because it's right in there. And their margins didn't go down as much. Okay, and that's what you will see. You will see these other guys who have more better sentiment in the underlying commodity do better. They will be impacted by costs, but in terms of the margin, at least their revenue is going up. Okay, and then we have the capital outlays, the blowouts here. Uh, uh, this is a famous one, Argonaut Magino. Some of this is operating cash flow. I'm sorry, uh, uh, cop capital cost escalation. But strangely enough, a lot of this is also scope changes, which when you dig into it, that was almost as big a problem. So a feasibility study at that accuracy is supposed to be plus or minus 15%, but this was 40 uh, 40 to 45% off. Um, sorry, 55% increase in upfront capital, 40 to 45% drop in share price. Um, and, and, and these studies are supposed to be plus or minus 15%. But going into an increasing uh, cost environment, those estimates, when they issue the study, they're taking estimates from six months before. So by the time it's released, and the time you put it in your numbers, it's already stale. But you're talking stale into a market that's going up 15 to 20%. So that's really stale. And so the other problem is that they had a lot of scope changes. They didn't do enough due diligence before in terms of the ground conditions. That impacted the tailings facility and the plant. And they didn't get the permit for the uh, power site. And so they have to do uh, on-site power, which made more capital. So uh, a lot of issues there. So in terms of that, we're late. Here's another interesting one. So if you look at Newmont, reserve and resource prices, focus in on resource uh, and reserves because resource affects the juniors more than reserves right now. But they basically haven't changed that number since 2015. And you can see what the gold price has done in the interim. Okay, so... $600 change in gold price, no change in estimate, uh, what's driving their resources and their reserves. So I did 
a, a list of about 39 non-producing gold companies listed on the TSX venture predominantly contain 150 million ounces measured, indicated, inferred, average ground, average grade two grams, open pit, underground. So, But on average, they use about 1565. So a resource about $165 per ounce higher. The range is huge, 1200 to 18. And now I think we're sitting at about 1850, 1860 uh, gold price. But if we want more M&A by these guys, and these guys might not be the ones that are buying, it might be the mid-tiers, um, they're going to have to change their assumptions. Either this is going to go down or that's going to go up. I think more likely this is going to go up. And now if we just look at reserves, what does a change in reserve do for somebody like Newmont? It gives them almost one more year of production. That's all. So that $200 change here from 1200 to 1400 uh, that's basically seven and a half million ounces that they deplete a year. It would just barely give them that. So in terms of re reserve price change for, un for majors, it's unchanged. So that's still in, in a good part of the cycle. So to sum up, between expiration trends, balance sheets, and reserve prices, we're still in a good part, potentially late, in the good part of that sector. But in terms of M&A, riskier M&A, um, equity financing, which getting harder for precious metal companies, operating costs escalating in a flat gold price environment, uh, we're, we're later in the cycle. All right, thank you, and that's it for me.